you know, time, if anyone's having still serious problems, uh, just let us know. Um, office hours on April 10th are going to be moved to the 12th, so from Monday to Wednesday, um, and from 11 to 1 o'clock, uh, basically so that I can go to the DEI and Tech Town Hall, which I recognize as a little hard to read, um, but there is an organization on campus that's trying to uh, capture uh, kind of a general, it's funny actually, they did a survey last year uh, called the uh, like the climate of uh, DEI factor on campus. And for the longest time, I thought it was about climate change because I hadn't read the like full thing. And it just said, you know, DEI climate survey. And I got very, very confused. Um, but so there's, uh, this is actually the second of the town halls. Uh, there, I think the first one was last year. Uh, and then this one this year, you should think about attending. Um, if you're having any trouble getting that QR code, it should be on the Spark website, uh, which is bu.edu slash Spark, uh, or you can see me after class and scan your QR code if you like. Um, so my office hours are moving. Uh, then the week of April 17th, so not next week, but the week after that, uh, is actually going to be a guest lecturer for both lectures, uh, which will be a uh, now PhD, I think. He, uh, uh, he had his defense the other day, so he'll be walking in the uh, you know, in May. Um, but his specialty is uh, kind of ethics in, in computer software, essentially. Uh, and so he is going to come and present about uh, the ethical considerations that you should be thinking about. Um, you know, hopefully you've noticed as we've been going along through the semester that a lot of the examples, the labs, the homeworks, that kind of stuff, actually have a, like ethical kind of scenarios. Um, and so really we try to talk about ethics all the way through the course. And if you're a data science major, it's actually really important to everyone who's designing the major and the minor, right? If you're taking these classes, uh, that we kind of imbue ethics into all of it because uh, it's really, really important. But so what he's going to be doing is lecturing about the formal definition. So kind of talking about, you know, like a formal framework. But one thing I want to point out is he's going to ask you to do some homework, uh, specifically around kind of case study type stuff. Um, but it'll be on a weird case. So he's going to basically give a lecture on the Tuesday, then assign some homework, and then expect the homework back before Thursday so that he can use it in the next lecture. That makes sense. So it's not the normal case. So that's why I want to call it out. It is in the syllabus, um, but just pay attention. Um, does anybody have any thoughts on why ethics is so important, particularly data science, but really in computer science in general? Because you can do really unethical things with a lot of data. Come on, I wanted examples. Oh, wouldn't it be fun? Cambridge here? Analytica. Cambridge Analytica is a great example, potentially influencing an election um, using data. If you're ever making any kind of visual representation of your data, you can do that when you just read it. Right. So, so you, your visualizations can be really deceiving. We've tried to show some examples of that. Um, isn't like facial recognition really bad at recognizing people of color? So, one of the things that is it's kind of ethical, it's kind of, um, it's also related to making good quality product. Uh, so if we don't see, and this is why the DEI and tech town hall and, and those movements are so important, is that if we don't see diversity in development teams, well, you tend to have a lot of people who look like me, for example. Uh, and so if you imagine a bunch of people who look like me building a facial recognition software, where do you think they're getting their pictures to test it from? Selfies, right? You know, maybe their families, right? Uh, so it's going to have a bias potentially, not always, but it does potentially have a bias based purely on the inputs. Uh, another big thing that people don't realize is the diversity of kind of cultural backgrounds or socioeconomic backgrounds that also has an impact. For example, I did an Indian cultural training a long time ago because I was thinking about moving to India for a while. Uh, and if you notice, a lot of men in the U.S. were wear a dress shirt like this. But with the top collar open, and you can see their undershirt. I don't know how true this is anymore. It was a while ago. But culturally, that was like seeing someone's underwear in India, where in the US, it was perfectly acceptable, right? So just minor cultural differences can make a big impact. And so these are the things that you want to be considering. Um, but I wanted anybody else have any fun examples 
fun examples of, of kind of ethical challenges that they've seen with data science? Eugenics, maybe? Eugenics is interesting. I don't know. Did we talk about that in this class yet? Yeah, okay. So we actually have an example around eugenics. Um, there's there's supposedly an ethical eugenics. Um, so, but it's it's one of those things that's really easy to uh, really misappropriate. Um, so, you know, you have to be really, really cautious. Uh, another thing that's kind of interesting is there are in things like universities, okay, and like hospitals, there are usually ethics boards, right? Where you say, I want to do this thing. And if it meets certain criteria, you have to go before a board and get it approved before you can do it. But in your average software company, for example, those don't normally exist, right? So as a result, all of you, if you're you know, kind of ever touching this stuff in the future, you need to take the responsibility for yourself. Okay, and you've seen some examples of that over the past few years. Um, I think it's both Amazon and Google employees refuse to work on uh, facial recognition technology for governments, uh, for example. Um, so those are the kinds of things that you would have to do as an individual, right? And the rest of your team may not uh, be willing to participate either. So you, you may have to step outside and say, I have this concern and bring that up, right? So it's a it's a big burden, especially because the most of what we do generally, when especially when we get more advanced, it's kind of a dark science, right? So not a lot of people understand how it really works. So you don't have a lot of people looking over your shoulder saying, hey, you did the wrong thing, because they don't understand that you're doing the wrong thing. So it's really, really important that you all have a very strong understanding of these problems. All right, there's my my minor range on ethics. Uh we can. We can certainly raise about it more uh, in the future. All right, any questions? All right, cool. All right, just kind of a little bit of a review. Correlation coefficient uh, is R, very, very important. And then we have some examples kind of at the bottom. Um, you know, when it looks like just a blob, that's an R and zero. Uh, but then when you have directionality, essentially, that means that there's some sort of correlation that you can measure that's useful, or there probably is. There are still challenges with that, obviously, but it does give you a hint uh, that you might be in the right direction for things like linear regression um, and certain kinds of nearest neighbor type calculations. Uh, there's another class of nearest neighbor uh, uh, calculations that we talk about in. We might actually get to it in this class, but generally speaking, we talk about it in later years. That's why I kind of struggle calling it nearest neighbor because there are multiple things called that. All right, but so that's the correlation coefficient. Like I said, it's really important you know kind of what it means and getting a hint of, of what it's at because uh, it, you use it a lot to kind of keep track of how are you doing with your models or whatever. All right, so two dons. Oh, I forgot to look it up. Like I said, they're related to manatees. Um, I think they are on the um, uh, endangered, that's what I'm looking for, uh, endangered species one. Uh, they're a very small population. We see them in uh, kind of in Europe. Um, but the reason we're talking about them is because we have some data about them. Uh, and specifically, we want to talk about uh, the residuals uh, and using residuals uh, when you're dealing with linear regressions. Um, so a, sc a scatter diagram of residuals could look like an unassociated blob for linear relations. Not a hundred percent sure that that's the technical term for it, or you know, but you get the idea. Blob, right? Everybody knows what a blob looks like. Um, do you have a question? Or, um, but we'll show patterns for non-linear relations. So in other words. Um, if you see a pattern in your residuals, then there's probably a, a problem with your approach. Uh, and used to check whether linear regression is appropriate, then you look, and, and the things in particular to look for are curve trends, changes in the spread outliers or any other pattern really, but I would say the most common ones you tend to see are things like curves. Um, I would actually say like changes in spread is probably the second most common. So some semi anecdotal. All right, but that's kind of the idea. Um, I think it's really warm in Yes. Let's see if I can do anything about it.
Uh, well, we we can adjust the CO two apparently. Uh, all right, I got nothing. I assume that's a light switch in the very back corner, right? Uh, near the door. Yeah. Okay. All right. So problems residual residuals from a linear regression always have a zero mean um, and uh, uh, sorry, root mean squared error. Um, is equal to the SD of residuals or the standard deviation of residuals, zero correlation with X, zero correlation with the fitted values. So remember the predicted values, we sometimes call it fitted. Uh, and these are all true no matter the data. Okay. <clears throat> so you have the demo. And I, I put the lecture in there, right? The lecture. No, okay. I know I started to, but I can remember if I actually did. Oh, I forgot to run all these. Um, those are just kind of functions we're going to use. Um, we're not really going to talk about them too much today. But so we have our dugong stable. Uh, so this is the age of the dugong and then the length. Uh, I believe it's in meters. Um, so a meter, you know, for all of us Americans, is about a yard, give or take. So about three feet. Um, and so this is the meters. And just kind of gives you some, you know, sense of the data. As you can tell, there's public, there's not a ton of data in here, but it'll give us what we were looking for, which is, you know, is there a relationship between the length and the age? So the first thing we do is let's take a look at scatter plot, right? Um, <laughs> right. Every semester I move classrooms. Uh, and so sometimes the classrooms are like wider and some of them are longer. And uh, it's like all my slides are, are pretty good for like wide, right? Because I can make them a little smaller um, and harder when they're long. Um, okay, so this is the scatter plot of the length and the age. Um, and it feels like there's a bit of a pattern here, right? Maybe there's a, a line in here uh, that we can use to predict it. Right, so the way we find out, right, is we actually calculate the correlation. And so that's just using the standard map we've been doing before, um, which is here, right? So we take the standard units of the column, the standard units of the other column, uh, and then multiply them together and take the mean, and that's how we get the correlation, okay? And then what we do is plot those residuals. So in other words, yeah, okay. So in other words, uh, our plot residual function up here is going to, I guess I haven't talked about the function, uh, is going to first calculate a line, okay? And then uh, basically calculate the predictions based on all the axes that we have. Then it's going to uh, draw the, the predicted spots in the scatter plot. Then it's also going to calculate the residuals. Let's just look at both of those real quick. Um, oops. All right, normally in Python, uh, things have to be above. Uh, so if you want to use something later in the in your code, it has to have been declared before that uh, because it's called a single pass compiler. Uh, and so I'm a little confused how it found fitted values. If you're getting an error, because those two cells would probably be inverted. Um, but it didn't go work. I don't really know why. Um, so the fitted values function is right. We're going to go calculate the slope and the intercept uh, of the data that we have. And then we're going to say, okay, um, we're going to take that slope, multiply it by uh, the um, the, the positions, right? The x axis, uh, and add it to the uh, intercept, and that's how we're going to get all those predictions. Okay, but we're kind of manipulating just arrays at once, so we don't have to go through the whole array, right? The other way we do this is actually do like a for loop and go through each item in the array. However, I'm lazy, so I don't do it that way, and I just manipulate the whole array at once. So that's how I get fitted values. Then the residuals. Are just a subtraction, right? So it's just the we're going to compare it to our known data, and we're going to say, okay, we have this prediction. 
We're going to subtract it from the, um, the actual value, and that's going to give us our residuals so that we can see how good a prediction we'll get. All right, and so if we look at it, here's our line, right? Except not quite a line. Uh, and so that's actually looking pretty good, right? So it looks like it's kind of in, in line with the data that we have. Um, however, as you might have expected, uh, our residuals are kind of all over the place, right? So they're not, they don't look like a blob, right? They almost look like a curve, okay? Uh, and so that tells us that our linear regression doesn't work for this data set. Okay. Does anybody have a theory as to why? Like, could you have guessed this going in? Yeah. It's probably grow like quicker at earlier stages of their life or at yeah. different times, different growing rates. Yeah. So, at different growing rates at different times in their life, uh, most animals actually stop growing. Does anybody know an example of something that doesn't stop growing? I think this one's amazing. Why is Boston? It's it, it's fully associated with Boston, Maine. Yeah, lobsters. Lobsters. Do you know we're not sure if they'll actually die of natural causes? They they they'll just live forever, and they just keep getting bigger. Is that like an awesome like nightmare scenario or what? Um, so yeah. Kind of crazy. If you ever get a chance, you should try to get over to the aquarium. They have some really unusual lobsters there, uh, assuming they're still alive. Uh, but there was a like an albino lobster and there was a blue lobster. Uh, so they're kind of cool. So, okay. So, like I said, we might have been able to guess going in that a dugong probably has a, a height limit, right? They kind of, at a certain age, they stop growing. Uh, most of us will do that. I would even hazard to say all of us, but I'm not 100% sure because data science. All right. So here is another data set. Um, these are, I think these are actually women Olympians, um, but basically we have a uh, height in inches and then their average weight. Uh, I keep meaning to go fix that column title. So there's ABG instead of ABE. It bothers me every time. Uh, but then I forget about it. So this is their average weight uh, in pounds. Uh, and so what we want to know is, is there a correlation between the height and the weight? And so if we do a correlation calculation, that's pretty good, right? So as, as a, you know, like I said, I think their women Olympians uh, get taller, they tend to weigh more. Oh, well, I kind of say it's a reason. All right, however, if we go through and look at our curve or our line, right? So um, you know, we do our fitted line here and try to predict what their height or sorry, what their weight will be based on their height. Um, we do a pretty good job for the most part, except if we look at those residuals, those are really not that. Okay. Um, and one of the things you'll learn in, in future classes if you're interested, right, is that this particular kind of curve actually indicates other approaches that we could use. But we're not going to get into that too much. Probably. All right. So some counter examples, um, primarily of you know using a linear regression, where it looks like the linear regression should have been really good, but in fact, when we uh, kind of test it using the residuals, we discover that it's not particularly good. All right. So. Uh, we talked about this a little bit, but numerical optimization is approximate but effective, um, and lots of machine learning uses numerical optimization. If the function RMSE of A and B returns the RMSE of estimation using the line estimate equals AX plus B, then if we use minimize with RMSE, it'll return an array and A sub zero, right? So the, uh, the first position uh, is the slope and B sub zero the intercept of the line that minimizes the NSC along lines with arbitrary slope A and arbitrary slope intercept B. Um, does anybody know why we say, like why we have what I was saying, sub zero, what that means? It's kind of similar to the P hat. Like why don't I just have some random variable name there instead of the A sub zero? Yeah. 
it's good that the zone theory was something else in the formula, right? So the A sub zero and the A have a relationship, but you want to distinguish that they're not the same necessarily. But so you use uh, tricks like A sub zero or A prime uh, to indicate that, oh, these, these two things are related. They may not be the same, but they're, they're going to be maybe not similar, but kind of like related, right? Uh, so that's kind of what that means. Just to give you a hint, um, because right, A, as it says here, right, it's going to be close. It's not necessarily going to be exactly A, right? But it's not necessarily going to be the slope. It's not necessarily going to be the intercept, but it's going to be close, okay, using the numbers. Oops. Maybe. Right. Maybe not have lost this one. Let's see. All right. So, but going back to kind of our earlier point, um, probably shouldn't have done over the slides yet, uh, but to the average of residuals. Uh, so, we are going to re like we round the residuals. It will come out to be zero. Um, and if we do it for the women as well, um, it also comes out to be zero, right? But the point here is to show you that that is not helpful in finding out whether the linear regression was a good one, right? Because it's always zero, no matter what the data set is, whether it's good for linear regression or not. So, more kind of to say, don't use this as a test. All right. However, uh, no matter what the shape, um, sorry, I think it's hard to read, but no matter what the shape of the scatter plot, the standard deviation of the residuals is a fraction of the standard deviation of the observed values of y, and that fraction is one minus r squared, or the square root of one minus r squared. Um, so, in other words, the standard deviation of the residuals is equal to the square root of one minus r squared, right, correlation coefficient, times the standard deviation of y, okay? So uh, this is just our data set with those demographics. Um, I think just keeping college percentage and median income uh, and our scatter plot. And if you recall, we had a pretty decent R value here, uh, but then we can do our fitted line and our fitted line comes out to looking pretty good at least, right? But then we can go and look at the residuals and the residuals also look pretty good, right? It's looking pretty blobby. Um, it's a little worrisome, right? That it gets a little bit spread out over to the right and up um, rather than kind of being a really uniform law. So there might still be a problem here. So let me catch up with my cheat sheet, make sure I know what we're supposed to put in here. All right. So the first thing we want to do is. We're, we're trying to figure out those standard deviations, but let's start with the uh, standard deviation of the uh, college percentage. Okay, so does anybody know what I should replace the question mark with to get the standard deviation of the college percentage, or the you know basically the percentage of people with college? And our table is called demographics. <laughs> Any ideas? Yeah, I'll give you this part of the hands. All right, who remembers what standard deviation operates on? Yeah. All right. An array. So how do we get the array of college percentage? Column. And we just get the name. All right. And so that's the standard deviation. I was like to check and make sure that my cheat sheet actually has the same value to uh, make sure I didn't have any tentacles. Uh, so 10.5 thereabouts, uh, and then if we do the standard deviation for our 
demographics, demographics. Um, oh, sorry, no, <clears throat> not doing that yet. We're going to do residuals of demographics, right? Because what we're trying to show is this math up here, right? So the standard deviation of the residuals is equal to the square root of one minus r squared times the standard deviation of y. And so the standard or the median, all right, we'll get to it. Um, so, oh, it takes, so this one takes just, wait, takes the table and then, yeah, it's gonna be, Parts inverted from the picture. Um, so median income. And so then we get um, just about 9,400, right? So 9,398 uh, is the standard deviation of the residuals. Okay, so we have a bunch of like, all the information that we have is known, so we can just calculate it. So what we're showing here is you can calculate it. But really what we want to do is, is when we have more unknowns, but I just want to kind of prove that it works, right? So next thing we want to do is get our R, okay? So the correlation. So we're trying to fill in all the gaps, right, in our um, calculation over here. Except we inverted the S and the Y. Uh, let you go back and fix. Um, so, what do we want to do here to assuming we couldn't figure out the standard deviation of the residuals because if we did the standard deviation of the residuals means we have to do all the work right so we would have to go and calculate the line and first we have to calculate, calculate this first we have to actually convert the standard units then we have to calculate the slope and then the intercept then we have to calculate the line, then we have to calculate the position on the line, then we have to do the subtraction, then we have to, uh, then we get the residuals, right? So that's a bunch of work that if we can avoid doing would be nice, right? So going by the, let's see if I can cut and paste the formula. Um, so I can, I don't know if this will look right, but both are nice. Oh, that's not too bad. Um, oh, well, it's kind of bad. Um, so the square root of, uh, which way to go? Uh, 1 minus r squared. And I'm just going to say t there, but kind of maybe get it right. So this is kind of our formula. I'll change this to the multiplication sign so it's a little easier to read. All right. So, how can we get to this value? We have the R, um, and we obviously have uh, the, the data. So, what would we write to make this formula so that we can get the standard deviation of the residuals without actually calculating the residuals? Any ideas? Yeah. We can do one minus r, um, r to the second, and then the whole thing to the half. Yeah, except we're going to cheat. There's actually a cool function called square root, which will make it a little easier to read. Um, and then, okay, then what? And we can multiply by the standard deviation of the medium and the let me just make sure my crayons are right way. Yeah. Okay. Let's see. M O O graphics. So, uh, just kind of introducing a new function here. You know, it's kind of like use it if you like. You can also use the. Uh, uh, double star to 0.5, um, but you can use the square root function if you find that easier to read. And so that's what we get the standard deviation of the residuals. So, and conveniently, right? Uh, 
blah, blah. Um, if we actually go through all the work and calculate residuals, then we pull the standard deviation of that. It's mm -hmm. just around 9,400. We get the exact same result or near enough for Python to get it right, um, which, yeah, it's close, but it starts to fall off over here. Now, remember, right, set for, for that slide. Um, oh, actually, that's what I was talking about. Anyway. So, believe me, but so this is probably Python. You get once, like, the, once you get out there on the decimals, it starts to get a little wonky. Uh, there are ways to fix that if you really care about being really, really precise. You just uh, need to treat your numbers actually more like strings and kind of go and calculate the individual pieces and you can kind of keep track. So there are ways around this, but for the vast majority of these kinds of problems, you don't need to worry about it. So people don't, and they just use the fact that it's a little off. Um, like to, one of the things I recently learned, uh, so apparently physics and physics, if like you're doing like, advanced, uh, like sorry, uh, astronomy physics, um, when you get to kind of the higher levels, the estimate for pi, anybody know what the estimate for pi is in kind of astrophysics? 20. 20, did I tell the story already? Oh, all right, all right. So maybe I told the story already, right. apologies. I have a very limited set of stories. So sometimes I've lived a very short, fundamental life. Um, okay. Or maybe it's just the stories I can repeat in class are limited. Um, so, okay, so then by way of another example, we can do the standard deviation for the Dugong column of age. Um, and so we get a 7.7-ish. 7 uh, and then we, like I said, calculate the residuals, and we get to um, the standard deviation of that, and we can see it's about 4.3. But we can calculate the correlation, which is relatively cheap. Um, and then we can do the same thing we did before. And I'm going to cheat and copy and paste it. Except fix our data. I would say I often hear myself saying do a god because do god. And as you can see, we get a 4.3. So I wasn't entirely trying to lead you down a bad path, right? So it, it works. Right, so we can do a lot less calculation if we use this method rather than actually figuring out what the residuals are. Um, and so, what is the standard deviation of the residuals that tell us? Do you think? Like, why? Why do we care? It gives us some hints about how scattered that scatter plot would be, okay? Because we know the standard deviations. So, going back to the slides, um, yeah. So I shouldn't have jumped to quite this part yet. So, kind of continuing from there, right? What we're trying to do is we're we've done a bunch of things manually, right? So this is kind of like you know. You're taught to do addition, and then you should always use calculator after that, right? This is kind of the same idea. Now you're kind of we're starting to understand what's going on when we're doing these linear regressions that we're trying to calculate the residuals. Now we're trying to find ways to um, do all that work more cheaply, right? So this tells us with numerical optimization that we can get um, an RMSE, uh, we can get a slope and intercepts uh, that are pretty close. To what we to perfect, right? Not necessarily perfect, but close uh, by calculating it out. So, so first up, uh, as it says, a bit of a sidebar, um, and Sorry, it's just this is the uh, I shouldn't have written it this way. Okay, so x minus two raised to two three. Okay, so we end up with a line that looks like this, right? And so that's a you know 
nice little curve. And so if we want to know where the bottom of this is, right? So what we want to know is it's it's not in um, standard units, right? But we want to know kind of where the like where the intercept would be. Um, so you know you can see it visually, right? But if we don't have a way to see it visually, how can we figure out what the actual what, what the bottom is? So what is the minimum value? Does anybody have any ideas? We talked about this mechanism of a bit ago, um, but. What do you think I should put in here? Can you just saw me type it. Okay. All right, we'll, we'll kind of continue on here. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna say, X, three these friends along, um, two plus three. Okay, so, um, we can always figure out like the equation for a line, right? Um, you know, we're not going to do that so much in the top, but you know, this line we can figure out what the equation is for it uh, using that, right? And so this is the equation for that line. So if we put it into a function, and we're just going to call that function method, we're just going to call it f. Okay. And the reason is is because we want to be able to say. Okay, given a particular x value, what is the y value? Okay, for any any spot. So the first thing we drop in there is two point one, and as you can see in the graphic, right, um, we should get just shy or just over three. Okay, and that's what we get. So we know our function right, um, and then you know try one point four. Uh, which is about here, right? And so 1.4, I don't know, about 3.4. Uh, and yeah, 3.36, so pretty good guess. Um, so now what can we do if we want to find this spot easily? Do we remember? Are we quickly looking through prior notebooks? It was towards the end of the last lot, it was before, I can't remember which. All right. Any ideas? Come on. It's really easy. It's like right there in the day. Yes. Is it minimum? Minimize, but yes. So we use minimize, as many you type. And remember, what we do is for this, we actually pass the method to it. So it's kind of like the apply function. We can pass the actual method to it, and we end up with um, uh, the, the minimum value that will satisfy the equation. So in other words, like, we we have to set up our function correctly, right? Because what we want to know is where where's the lowest point in the line, right? So we have to set up the function such that it can test the x's and give out y's. And essentially, not exactly, but essentially, what minimize is doing is plugging in every value of x and then finding the lowest value. Okay. The cool thing about this is that there's a bunch of math behind the minimize function that can get rid of pieces of the search space it's called. Okay, so the search space, right, is, you know, infinity, negative infinity to positive infinity, right? You've got to test everything. However, because there's lots of smart people who put together lots of basically mathematical formula, you can remove parts of the search space and I'll just make something up, right? Like, you know, because of X, Y, and Z formula, you can get rid of everything between you know, whatever, 30 and 300 million, or maybe, and then there's another one that says 300 million to infinity, you can get rid of, or whatever it is. So it's not actually testing at all. That's why it's still relatively inexpensive to use, but that's what it should feel like it's doing. Okay, so it's like testing the whole space. So we can see that it's pretty close to right, right? 1.9 um, is about the right X value. Uh, for or yeah, so is the because what it's going to give you back is the input to the the question. So 
Uh, let me just uh, add a cell here. I don't know how to do it. Um, so now if I call F with minimize F, right, what I should get is the lowest spot on the Y axis. That makes sense? Right? Because what it's returning is what's the input to the method, not the output, which I think is something weird. All right. So we can also do it with something more complicated. For example, this curve, right? That one's significantly more interesting. Um, and one of the things that we talk about when we're thinking about trying to find these minimums or uh, you know, when we're trying to talk about those search cases that we're trying to uh, find these pieces of data is the problem of this spot here, right? What do you think the problem is with that spot? Right, it's it's obviously not the lowest point, but what? Why do you think that's kind of problematic? Otherwise, unlike that other curve we looked at, which had one bottommost spot. Any ideas? If you were implementing minimize, what would be the difficulty of that? That point is a local minimum. Yeah, so it's referred to as a local minimum. Um, and so if you imagine, right, that your minimize function is searching along, let's say it's coming in from this end, right, and it's testing all these axes, okay, and it gets here, how does it know to necessarily keep going, right? It might say, oh, I found the minimum, right, and just kind of give up and call it a day, right? When in fact, it's only reached the local minimum. Right, so this this area is a minimum, but it hasn't found the global minimum. Okay, so that's one of the, the challenges that we don't deal with a lot. Is you imagine, you know, the functions we're normally dealing with are not only significantly more complex than this, but on top of that, might even be multi, uh, like not just in the x and y plane, right? So it could be in the z plane, or we often will call it n space. Okay, and n space means like there's lots of dimensions. Okay. So it's very easy to fall into that trap because what you're trying to do is you're trying to balance, right, the amount of effort you're putting in to making sure you get a good answer. So those local minima can be really a challenge. So, but at least for now, we can get by this problem. By, let me just make sure I'm not trying to throw something else. By creating a mathematical function, right, that uh, calculates the y based on the x, just like we did before, except I'm not going to type it in. Um, and now we can say, hey, minimize this one for us. Pete, because I can't type. Oh, I never ran this function. Okay, so what it tells us is that uh, negative 0.51 is the lowest x, or will give the lowest y for that x, right? So, and just kind of using the same example we did a minute ago, um, we can compare it to what what is that y, right? So now we can say, oh, if I can type it correctly this time. Nope. All right, and negative two. And that looks right looking at the top, you know, what little you can see of the graph. Um, and so pretty handy, right? So it found the correct minimum, not just that local one, but the global one. All right. So as it said, you know, there was a bit of a sidebar because you can use this for a lot of different scenarios. Um, but in our case, what we care about it for is trying to find uh, the smallest RMSE. Right, so in other words, the smallest amount of error. Okay, so for us, because we can do this, we're actually going to calculate it out. Okay, so we get our demographic RMSE, um, and we put that in a function, and then it's also just programmed into a error plot. So now we have a function where we can test and calculate. The, the resultant RMSE, 
so that we can, uh, so this is just like those line functions, except it's giving us back um, the, the lowest R in the C. So I showed this a little bit last time or sometime before today. Sorry. <laughs> All right, and so what we can do is we can use minimize just like we were doing before and get to demographics R of E. Okay, and so this gives us, and you may remember this from last time, uh, this is the R of E we're looking for. Okay, so, uh, but remember now we're getting two answers back because our function takes two parameters. Oops, let me try to highlight that. So it takes two parameters. So unlike the prior functions in that one where we were just doing X and Y, this is looking for a slope and an intercept. So we need two results, right? We need a slope and we need an intercept. So because there are two inputs into the method, then we will get two outputs from minimize, uh, which will be the slope and the intercept for where the lowest error is. Um, and from, you know, kind of rolling way back, um, if we look at our regression slope that we calculated earlier and our regression intercept, but just for the sake of making them look alike, we can put them in an array. And as you can see, our output is exactly the same or nearly exactly the same as using the minimized function. Um, you know, and, and so we do need to keep in mind, right, that we're getting an array back this time. So let's say we wanted to go on and do some calculation with the slope. We need to go and dereference it. It's referred to as we need to go pull it out of the array uh, to be able to use it, right? All right. So, uh, any questions so far? Does that make sense? So we're basically, we talked through kind of doing linear regression, then figuring out uh, what, um, whether the linear regression was good using residuals, right? And then we can also figure out what that, what should that line be by using a minimized function on an emergency C calculator. So in other words, we're trying to find the smallest error Right. And so what we need is the slope and the intercept to get the line. So now we have some really cheap ways of trying to get to a line that will uh, you know properly predict the data and an idea of whether a line is a good idea to begin with. Okay. So then we move on to classification. So in um let's say data science, machine learning, um, there's often kind of two big problems, okay. One is how do we predict something? So if I have you know the parent's height, I want to predict the kid's you know height ultimately. Okay, so I'm going to predict something. We also have a concept called classification. So this is kind of more like where we want to know is is this thing more similar to this group of things or that group of things? Okay. Uh, so going back to our our examples from the very beginning of the class, right? Um, how do I make this person more similar to the Republican Party or the Demogra uh, Demogra Democratic Party, not Demographics Party. Um, and, uh, you know, so if, but we need to know which one they're like closer to. So that's, that's classification. We're trying to talk about how do we, you know, how, how similar are they to this other group? So when we want to guess the value of an attribute, okay? So in other words, we have an individual, and let's say in this case, the individual is a human. Are they a Democrat or a Republican? How can we guess the value of the attribute? So generally, it's based on incomplete information, right? As you might imagine, we rarely have all the information we'd like. Um, and we can predict an outcome for an individual. Um, so this is kind of worded slightly differently than I would like, but predict an outcome for an individual, find others who are like that individual, and who the outcomes you know Use those outcomes as the basis of your prediction. That the wording's a little wonky, um, but the types of prediction are really categorical, which is classification, and regression, which is numeric. Okay. 
Okay, so when we are trying to predict a height, right, that's a regression um, because we just want a number out. But if we want a classification or categorical result, so like Democrat versus Republican, using Cambridge Analytica as an example, um, we call that a classi classification or a classifier. All right. So these have some very practical uh, scenarios, right? Um, how, how many people here have never got, or how many people here have never gotten spam? All right. Does anybody know why it's called spam? Yeah. Uh, is it because they sent like a lots of advertisements for the spicy ham thing or? Uh, no, it's not spam's fault. Uh, uh, it's actually, you know, I know there's like a video where like the guy's like saying spam, spam, spam. Yeah, so it's an old Monty Python skit. Yeah. Uh, and basically the implication in the Monty Python skit is that spam, you you don't want spam. Spam, the like the company who makes it uh has suffered from this ever since. I don't know if you've seen the ads lately of uh don't knock spam until you've fried it, uh if I think they're current tagline. Uh, ask any Hawaiian if spam is a good thing. Uh, generally, they will say yes. Um, so it, it's kind of, eh, you know, but the, the big thing here when we talk about it in technology it is slang, okay? But we actually talk about there's a, there are two classifications. Uh, one is spam, and the other one is ham, okay? So good email is in the ham category, and bad email is in the spam category. Uh, so this is a very common classifying problem, all right? And there's actually very sophisticated machine learning algorithms that uh, try to solve uh, this problem. Uh, so, you know, as you've probably all experienced, right, you can report spam, right? But it actually uses that reporting spam to train the algorithms that are trying to figure it out. It's not like now just collecting a list of all the spam emails that could possibly ever happen and then doing like exact matches and what it's trying to do is say these things are all similar to each other and these ones that weren't reported are all similar to each other yes google is reading all of your mail maybe not by a human but google is reading all your mail um, and looking at the two classifications and it's saying okay these ones over here, the, the bad ones right are in the spam bucket and the good ones are in the ham bucket and then when any given email comes in, it tries to classify it as hand or spam. Okay. And so uh, one of the approaches for that is this mechanism called Bayesian algorithms. Uh, and those are actually pretty new. Um, and I think the guy it's named after is uh, still like a practicing mathematician, statistician, I don't know what he does exactly. Um, so there it is. And what's so interesting about classification ones in particular, unlike the numerical predictions, is most of you can look at that and tell, right? You, you are very good at classifying things. Um, the problem is the scale, right? You can't, you can't classify 10,000 emails in a few minutes. You have to, you, you'd be at it for a long time. Here's another classification example, okay? Um, which you probably all experienced. Has anybody looked at a pair of shoes and then seen lots of very similar shoes and advertisements for like the next couple of days? And okay. anybody know why that is? The one that really pisses most people off is when you buy a pair of shoes and then you get a bunch of ads for similar shoes. Why you know why that is? Other than the obvious, because you might buy a pair of shoes, but do you know what's going on underneath? Uh, there's a model that tries to predict like what other things you'd be interested on. Basically. Right, so there's, there's a classifier that's trying to predict what other things you might be interested in. The, the really what I was getting at though was the question of how does when you go and look at a pair of shoes at, I don't know, like Vans, okay, how does the Adidas website know that you looked at this pair of shoes at Vans? That's the because Adidas isn't running that ad software, it's ran by Google Ads. So. Yes, that's one example, but yeah, so it's running run by what's called an ad network, of which Google is a big one, um, but there are actually a bunch of others. Uh, funnily enough, uh, many of the top ones, first of all, you've never heard of, second of all, are founded in Boston, which I don't know if that's playing favor. 
Um, but uh, so you have these ad networks. And so the fact that you got this ad in this one place um, is actually being delivered by this ad network, who is also going to then know when you go to somewhere else that uses that same ad network, uh, it's going to know to surface the same kind of classified data. Um, yeah, there was another funny example there, but I can't remember what it was. So the idea is just that with the classifiers, it will, you know, when you're trying to classify things, you're trying to show things that are similar. And we have a brief demo. Okay. Uh, this one being more on the beneficial side. Okay. So we're going to classify patients. Okay. And so we pick up this table, uh, which has basically a bunch of features about uh, a lot of humans. Um, and specifically, we're going to look at. Um, We're going to look at uh, yeah. So, um, so what we do a lot of times with this data, okay, is we actually say in advance we have. Uh, remember, I was talking about ground truth. So we have someone or you know a group of someone's actually label them with the correct answer, okay, so that we can use it to now train our classifier. So then going back to the same example, sorry. Mm -hmm. Going back to the same example, this is every time you report a spam, you are contributing to the classification. Okay. So in this data set, we have classified um, people with um, you know in class one or in class zero. Uh, and we'll we'll get more into it in a minute. Um, and but the, the data we're mostly going to look at, if I recall correctly. Um, is glucose, white blood cell counts, and hemoglobin, okay? And basically measuring those things and their relationship to this class. So, the first thing I want to do is I want to know how many are in each group. So how would I do that? Any ideas? So I want to know how many of class one and how many are in class zero. In this data set, group exactly. So we can just group, and now we get a count of the two, right? Um, because when we don't provide uh, the default for the group function, is to just count them. All right. So then we're going to throw them in a scatter plot. Um, the the kind of optional parameter over here is letting us say these are in this color and these are in, in that color. Um, and what we want to see here, kind of cut off, is our X and Y, right? Our blood cell count, we haven't really looked at a scatter plot this way, but we have white blood cell count is on, on the bottom, we have glucose on the side. Uh, and so the dots though are colored by the class zero and class one. Okay. And so Let's just say for the sake of argument that class zero, and I think this is the way the data actually is, but class zero are normal, okay, and class one are ill somehow. Okay. So what do we want to find out? It is. What would be why would I use this? Right, and if we say class zero is normal and class one is sick, we obviously want to figure out if some random person comes in, are they sick or are they normal? Right. So the way we do that is by using these classifiers. So what we want to know is are they closer to the blue, right, or closer to not blue, really? Okay, because if you notice the way this particular data set comes out, we have. Um, it's kind of like this center purple and everywhere else, right? Uh, hopefully they have non-zero blood, uh, white blood cell counts and glucose, otherwise they would be dead. Um, but then let's say we're not sure that that's enough information to properly classify them. So we might want to look at hemoglobin and glucose as well. And so now we have these classes again, 
Again, we're going to say class zero is normal and class one is ill. Okay. So what we're kind of looking for, if you if you kind of combine the two in your head, we're kind of looking for high levels of hemoglobin, right? And low levels of white blood cell cell count. Kind of. All right. So how do we go about? Yeah. Okay. As I kind of say here, we want to be able to predict the class of someone without having to plot and eyeball this graph every time. And one way to do this is put some thresholds into our code. And so one of the thresholds is we're going to say, okay, max glucose for class zero. Okay. And how do I figure out what the max glucose for class zero is? Well, the first thing we want to do is get only class zero, right? So how would I do that? And the table is CKD. What method would I use to get only class zero? Uh, how about here? Um, like use the like where? Where, exactly. And what would I do? Where what? Um, where classes uh as uh, are equal to uh, right the collisions of those it's take longer than my fingers zero and you then take the column take the what do I take just uh, finish your thought take, take the column uh of um Right, except I don't want the whole column, I want the max. Right. And to be honest, even though, oops, um, even though I just wrote it all in one line, you might want to seriously think about this, doing this in multiple stages. Um, because I wouldn't be surprised if I have a friend wrong, because uh, it would be less likely to run the product, but you also wouldn't be able to see it then. Okay, so now if I wanted to get the minimum hemoglobin, right? Because what I want to know is I want the max glucose and the minimum hemoglobin. So we can say CKD where um, class, again, we'd actually be able to reuse this too. So our equal to, well, and then we're going to get column. Um, we're going to pull the mean off that. Okay. And oh, the hard dot equal to, sorry. Making up methods over here. All right. And let me print those real quick. All right, so the maximum glucose for class zero is 140, and the uh, minimum minimum hemoglobin for class zero is 13. Um, and so now all we can write classify. Okay, and so our classifier is going to be if hemoglobin is less than our minimum. Or our max, oops, our glucose is greater than our max glucose. Then we want to return turn yes versus, oh, sorry. No, we actually want to, this is returning the class. Um, else, there's something wrong here. And we'll probably error it. And we just actually try it. I think I, oh, maybe it's a normal bug. 
All right, the timing is weird. Um, and so if we try these two, right, uh, this is going to tell us which class it's in. Okay. And so now we can say, hey, we have now built our own little classifier based on trying to get it in that region. Right. So now we can make a guess if we measure the hemoglobin and the glucose on occasion. We can feed it into our little pot fire and it'll tell us whether or not we think this person is, you know, normal or sick, right? And that's kind of all there is to it. That's how we, we build the pot fire. And we're nearly out of time, so I don't think I'll get into the next one. Um, let me just see. Yeah, I'll. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good question. Yeah. I'm wondering how that's accurate because there are yellow dots in the blue region for glucose and white blood cells. Right. So our clock fire isn't perfect. Okay. Right. But it's it's a good start. Okay. Right. As well as you know, just because I bought this pair of shoes, doesn't mean I'm out of that pair of shoes. And we're totally wrong about Sam. So that's that's kind of a whole another bucket of problems. Right. Is how do we get it more accurate? Um. So just trying to set up. I want to cover this one real quick. I think I'll mostly just show it. So we also have banknotes. Okay, so let's say we want to try to classify banknotes as whether they're um, real or fake, right? Seems like a common thing. Um, I don't know how much you know about banknotes, but banknotes these days are very sophisticated. Uh, they actually have wavelet measurements. So when you hold it up in light, like how the light travels through it. Uh, is part of how the design of the banknote, and one of the things they have to try to replicate if you want to fake a banknote. Um, and so that's what this part is showing you. Um, and so we're just going to look at how much data we have, okay, which ones are in uh, group zero and group one. Um, and but what's kind of cool is we can now start to look at which classes they are, and then do that same kind of comparison idea, except with these banknotes. Um, but then lastly, the really the thing I was going to show you in this particular case is that I was kind of addressing before, right? We very quickly, when we start talking about multiple features that we care about, now get into multiple dimensions, right? And so we can actually still start to print them up to a point, okay? Um, but then it gets really wonky after a bit. Uh, but we'll kind of leave it there. Uh, any questions? Yeah. Oh, uh, let's say, I don't know, 32. I don't know if that was the same as last time, but. Any other questions? All right.